Welcome to The Big Conversation here on Unbelievable with me, Justin Briley. The Big Conversation is a series of shows exploring faith, science, philosophy, and what it means to be human in association with the Templeton Religion Trust. Today, our conversation topic is the future of humanity. Have science, reason, and humanism replaced faith? The Big Conversation partners I'm sitting down with today are Stephen Pinker and Nick Spencer. Stephen Pinker is a professor of psychology at Harvard University whose work spans sociology, evolution, language and philosophy. His latest book, Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism and Progress, makes the case that human progress has never been greater and we need to guard against unscientific ways of thinking, including religion, to see it continue. Bill Gates has described Enlightenment Now as his new favourite book of all time. Nick Spencer is research director at Theos and the author of books such as The Evolution of the West, How Christianity Has Shaped Our Values. He believes that while the story of progress may be true, modern thinkers often fail to realise how indebted Western values of equality, democracy and science are to Christianity. Stephen and Nick, thank you very much for joining me on the programme today. Uh, Stephen, Enlightenment Now, you use a huge wealth of data to uh, show that the world is in a better place, essentially, than it ever has been. Yet, looking at our news feeds, you'd be forgiven for thinking that we're in a worse place. Why, why do you think generally people adopt a more pessimistic attitude than perhaps the data suggests? Well, as long as bad things haven't uh, fallen to zero, there'll always be enough of them to fill the news. And if our, since our intuitions about risk and danger and probability are driven by available uh, images and narratives and anecdotes, uh, as long as the, the news feed contains enough of them, and indeed if the news becomes um, uh, more thorough, uh, covers more of the, of the uh, planet, we can uh, fall under a, an illusion that things are getting worse simply because we're more aware of the events that take place and we don't have a uh, background of all of the things that are going well which never make the news. You don't see a reporter uh, in front of a high school saying, here I am reporting live from a school that has not been shot up <laughs> yeah. or a country that's not at war or mm. a city that hasn't suffered a terrorist attack uh, or a, uh, a village where the uh, inhabitants have, have um, uh, escaped from extreme poverty over the last uh, 10 years. And that's because often the, the advances are incremental rather than sudden they're, they're incremental and they often consist of uh, bad things that don't happen, which mm. by definition are not news. <laughs> uh, uh, people living in peace. Uh, people living in peace is just, is, it's, it's not news because it's not an event of any kind. And obviously in the book you make the case that uh, science, reason and humanism are largely responsible for, for this progress. Um, to what extent, though, do you see Christianity, religion in general, as being a help or a hindrance in, in the progress? Well, it, it depends on whether you're referring to the beliefs or the institutions. Uh, the beliefs, I think, are, are a hindrance. I think that uh, any kind of supernatural belief, as opposed to our best scientific understanding of reality, uh, can't possibly help. Uh, if you believe that disease is the result of uh, divine punishment or that uh, curing it is a result of intercessory prayer, then that's clearly not going to make any progress towards global health. Uh, if you think that um, God would not let bad things happen to the planet, so we don't have to worry about man-made clim- climate change. Any kind of belief that is just literally uh, not, not true, not, or at least not true to the best of our understanding. Now, uh, likewise, I think a belief in um, a valuation of souls as opposed to lives uh, is, is not helpful because it implies that our time on earth is just an infinitesimal portion of our existence, that if you send someone off to heaven, you might be doing them a favor. If uh, someone is uh, perhaps seducing people into eternal damnation, then they're a uh, public health menace and they ought to be neutralized for the greater good of all. So I think there's a a large set of supernatural beliefs that we're much better off abandoning. But the institutions... But the institutions, though, uh, because institutions evolve, including religious institutions, including some but not all Christian denominations. And if uh, institutions, I think largely under the uh, influence of um, Enlightenment values, back off from the literal supernatural beliefs, back off from the... um, the, the uh, Iron Age morality in, in uh, a lot of the uh, Old Testament, such as uh, uh, capital punishment for homosexuals, um, and uh, begin to align their goals with, with uh, humanistic ones, then, uh, then they can be a force for tremendous good mm-hmm. by mobilizing communities, by encouraging uh, altruism. Uh, but it depends very much on the extent to which each institution uh, commits itself to humanistic values. 
I mean, obviously, you're, you're an atheist yourself. And at the end of the book, you do quite strongly critique religion um, and cite, I think, quite approvingly, the fact that atheism or non-religion is on the rise compared to Christianity in the USA, for instance. Do, I mean, overall, do you think that less religion, more progress, essentially, is what we're looking at? I mean, I wouldn't put it that way. I would say more humanism, more pro- progress. Okay. Uh, but uh, the absence of uh, of any particular belief is not a, uh, a a positive or a progressive force for for anything. Uh, I think it is good not to be misled by uh, by false beliefs, but one also has to have uh, positive values. So, and, and in the case of uh, humanism, these would be human flourishing, mm. life, health, mm. education, richness of experience, happiness for as many people as possible. Without that, then atheism by itself is just just, uh, is, is nothing. It's just the absence of a particular belief. Nick, it's great to have you joining us on the program today as well. And be, I'm really looking forward to how you you engage with the particular viewpoint that mm. Stephen has. You've read the book. Um, by and large, do you agree with the, the, the fact of, if you like, scientific progress and moral progress, I suppose, at the same time? Yes, I do. Um, and I have to begin by saying I'm not temperamentally disposed in that direction. <laughs> Um, I, um, having worked in social research for a while, I was uh, aware of a number of the kind of the upward trends with regard to health, life expectancy, so on and so forth. But one of the uh, many strengths of the book is the fact that you know, there are 70, 80 charts in there. There's 250 pages going through the obvious facts such as health and uh, life expectancy to eccentric but rather wonderful ones like likelihood of being struck by lightning is less <laughs> now than it was 100 or so years ago. So. Given the fact, um, temperamentally, I am not inclined towards um, progress. I think Stephen does a brilliant job in making the case. And I think, I think there are some chapters there that should almost be compulsory reading. I think the one on terrorism, for example, which you place the scale of the problem within a wider context is a, is a, is a very great example of, as it were, talking us down from the ledge of panic that we have got ourselves mm. to. So um, in that regard, um, I think it's, I mean, I do think it's a wonderful book anyway, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of entirely so in lockstep you, you, with you, Stephen on you, that. So you agree, in a sense, with the, the story of progress. What about the, the reasons, obviously, that Stephen brings to bear, though? Mm. Science, reason, humanism as the defining things that, that are responsible? Well, um, this is where Stephen and I would part company, in a sense. So science, reason, humanism, I would be entirely pro, but... Societies develop through the what polit- political scientists call the development of inclusive institutions. These are institutions that incorporate people and give them freedom, equality, and um, a degree of um, st- stable self-interest in order to develop. Now, a lot of these came to fruition in the 18th century, largely because of what happened in England in 1688, which we might come on to. But my, um, I suppose, critique of it is that the vast number of those inclusive institutions existed, certainly in theory and very often in practice, long before the Enlightenment. So let me give one really kind of eccentric example. In 1623, the English Parliament published the Statute of Monopolies. It's a completely insignificant historical event, except for the fact that it put patents on a secure legal basis. If you have patents on a secure legal basis, it makes it worth your while to invest money to develop things that you know you're going to get a return from. Property rights is another. Rule of law is a third. Some form of political accountability, even to the extent of democratic accountability. These are inclusive institutions, and almost all of them predate the 18th century. And even those that are on the cusp, say something like John Locke's articulation for political toleration and political equality, both of those are, I think, rightly you could come under the rubric of the Enlightenment, but it's very telling that Locke justifies his um, letter concerning toleration and his essays on government on theological grounds. So, so essentially the, the Enlightenment and its focus on science and reason and political equality and everything else, in a sense, didn't come out of a vacuum. It was, it, it was preceded by important institutions. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's precisely my point. So I don't want to, as it were, downgrade the 18th century because what happened there was very important. I think actually it was more due to the historical circumstances of what happened in England. And, and is your argument that it was specifically a Judeo-Christian heritage that, that informed the way that the Enlightenment was able to take place? Primarily, not exclusively. So mm. I think, you know, 
Europe is Christian for mm. a thousand years. You are going to get examples of horrendous crimes and wonderful virtues mm. in that period. Now, Stephen is right that one of the legacies, and I say this as a Christian myself, one of the legacies of Christianity are things like the Inquisition or the wars of religion, although they were slightly more complex than simply one religion versus another. But another legacy of Christianity is one specific example. 1215 Magna Carta, first proper articulation of the rule of law in Latin Christendom. It is not drafted, but influenced massively by Stephen Langton, who's an Archbishop of Canterbury, who whilst he was at the University of Paris a few years earlier, glosses on Deuteronomy, which talks about how the law has to be above the king. So this principle of the rule of law, which of course takes many, many centuries to fully bed down, is developed in a distinctively Christian culture. I don't want to claim mm. all the positives for Christianity by any means, but there are plenty of, as it were, institutions, inclusive institutions, or at least ideas behind inclusive institutions that are developed long before the Enlightenment. What, what do you say to that, Stephen? Do you think yeah, that... I don't, that I, I don't disagree with that, and, and uh, I use the Enlightenment as a... Um, uh, just as, as a convenient label for a set of ideas that are historically concentrated in the second half of the 18th century. But as I, I noted, I, they ha certainly have precedence in the Age of Reason and the Scientific Revolution, which are conventionally located in the 17th century, and the era of classical liberalism, conventionally located in the first half of the 19th. So these, as with any historical development, nothing comes out of, out of, uh, out of the blue, out of nothing. Uh, and the Enlightenment is just where I think a lot of it was concentrated. But absolutely, there were, there were precedents. Uh, I mean, it's hard to attribute things like the law of patents to Christianity, although it did. Everything has to take place somewhere, yes. and Europe was Christian, and so in yes. that sense, it, 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 its birthplace was a, uh, a Christian civilization. But uh, there's nothing in Christianity yep. itself that justifies the law of patents. So I think that's a very important point. As a, a, as a historian, you'd want to disambiguate things that originated in a Christian culture and those that originated for a Christian reason. Mm. Yes, um, exactly. And, and patents, I think, are an example of the former. Yeah. But a very important example of the latter, I think, is the scientific revolution itself. Now, you know, the, the world had seen many scientific revolutions, you know, in, in, in ancient Greece, in ancient Rome, in China, famously, in 9th century, 10th century Baghdad, 13th, 14th century Paris and Oxford. All of them are kind of nascent mm. scientific revolutions that could have transformed the world. And none of them did. Um, now, the one that happened in the 17th century em em emphatically did. And it's very telling that the reason it did was because it was justified on explicitly theological grounds. If you go back to someone like Francis Bacon, writing at the beginning of the 17th century, he justifies science, which of course is called natural theology, on specifically biblical grounds. So I think one of the pushbacks I would have is that the book doesn't quite sufficiently acknowledge that... As, uh, as a development from Christendom, which is not simply a cultural development, but is actually a theological development. Well, it's uh, it, uh, that was the the, uh, the the water that everyone swam in. I mean, that was the the air that they breathed. So everything had to be justified in terms of uh, the belief systems that were common ground among the people of, of the era. Uh, and since it only happened once, uh, we can't compare. Look at the full range of civilizations that had scientific revolutions, versus, or at least ones that persisted, versus ones that, that don't detest the hypothesis that, that Chris, specifically Christian ideas were a prerequisite to the scientific revolution. But see, to, to push back on that, I think you can, because you have the counterexamples of China, which famously Joseph Needham spent you know, a, a lifetime studying. Why China, this amazingly technologically developed nation, or uh, state for the sake of arguments, um, much more so than Europe, didn't translate that technological development into a full-scale scientific revolution. And he comes to the conclusion, and, and, and others following him have agreed, that it was a lack of what Christians would call a doctrine of creation, we needn't go into that now, that, that, that as it were, didn't provide a soil for the scientific revolution to happen. So actually, I think there are counterfactuals that you, you, you can cross-compare. And, and one of the distinctive factors is um, the, uh, the, the, the Christian doctrine of creation that legitimized and encouraged the study of the natural world as a way of understanding and glorifying God. Uh, 
But uh, I mean, but the, the same counterfactual would have to ask why didn't since that was uh, imminent in Christianity from the start, why did it take uh, you know, 1,200 years uh, if those ideas were yeah. uh, there there all along? So it's very hard for things that happened only once. Yep. I mean, you can do you can try to come up with the counterfactuals, and of course, every idea has numerous mm. you know tendrils and roots and influences and tributaries. Uh, so it's it's it, it's certainly possible mm. that that Christianity was one, part. I mean. It, undoubtedly it was part of the context. Whether it was causal, I think is harder to establish. Uh, of course, I mean, causality in history is, is is really tough. But I think the scientific revolution is, is a fascinating example of Christianity um, both being kind of um, uh, a, a catalyst and also a foe. So so the catalyst for, for was, as I've said, a lot of theological argument. But the reason it happened in, say, 1600 or, or slightly later, as opposed to 1500, was because Europe had dragged itself into this massive epistemological crisis in the Reformation where Catholics fought Protestants and they undermined one another. And in the end, the arguments that had been thoroughly uh, sort of strong in 1500 were much weaker in 1600. So, as it were, Christianity created the problem for which it also created the solution. <laughs> History is a real mess like that. I, I mean, do you do you personally think that science, scientific progress has, if you like, validated a, a secular or, or even atheistic view of reality as opposed to a, a religious one? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, it certainly... Um, uh, you know, just in in terms of literal factual beliefs, like the uh, age of the Earth, the origin of humans, the nature of life, the size of the universe, um, has uh, undermined the actual the factual claims of uh, Scripture. Uh, it has also presented a a picture of the laws of nature that allow um, no place for any kind of uh, goal, purpose, teleology, uh, or a concern of the uh, with human affairs of the, the, the laws of the universe. Uh, the origin of life, which used to be one of the great holdouts, the, the idea that, that it, even if the uh, physical world could be explained by purely mechanistic processes, life required some divine spark, was undermined, but first by Darwin and then by uh, Watson and Crick. And I, I think we're, we're seeing that happen with, uh, with the mind as well. The idea that there's an uh, uh, immaterial soul is becoming less and less te- tenable. Do you think with that the ultimately a kind of a naturalistic explanation will will give us everything we need in terms of explanations of, of who we are and, and where we came from? Uh, I mean, the it will certainly crowd out um, supernatural explanations. What, what's uh, your your uh, view on that, Nick? I mean, it, we're we're going into sort of this is deep waters. Deep, deep waters here. Yeah, yeah. So just waters. just one comment, I suppose, before we move on. Um, I, I suppose my one comment. I mean, obviously, self evident. I disagree with Stephen in much of that. Perhaps not all of it. My one comment would be a, a caution in this particular debate. I'm reminded of a of a debate by by two 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 thinkers, e- even greater than than those gathered <laughs> around the table. Um, Bertrand Russell and and Frederick Copleston mm. um, were debating this subject just after the war and they almost argued each other to a standstill because Copleston argued that the universe had a creator and Bertrand Russell argued no we can justify we say it's been there forever Mm. and of course what happened was that 20 or so years later the idea of a big bang and some kind of origins of the universe became uh, accepted scientific norm now in that instance in that particular debate that would have swung the pendulum away from Russell and towards Copleston. But of course, you never know what's right. going to be around the corner. So if you bank all your kind of arguments on, 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 on the later scientific or indeed kind of historical wisdom, you've got to do so cautiously. Let, let, let's, let's move on to talk about progress a bit, because in a sense, um, scientific progress doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as moral progress. Um, uh, uh, some I know have accused you, Stephen, of of being too optimistic when it comes to our moral progress and that it is not the same thing as technological and scientific and oh, even welfare not, and so clearly on. Clearly not the same thing. No, um, no. So, but but you, you think that actually science and humanism and reason also engender a kind of a moral progress themselves? Uh, it, it's not just science and technology that uh, that propels moral progress, but moral progress uh, has taken place in in um, a parallel with scientific progress. The two f- feeding each other, uh, but they're not they're not the same thing. Uh, but uh, but yeah, moral progress has taken place in in abolition of slavery, abolition of uh, torture, of capital punishment for frivolous crimes, then capital punishment itself, in uh, subjugation of women and racial minorities, in oppression of homosexuals 
intellectuals, in um, uh, uh, autocracy, in uh, frivolous wars, uh, in pretty much any any dimension that you'd want to to uh, call moral, you could, uh, and to the extent that you can even pose the question, how we made progress or not, well, you've got to measure what it used to be like in the past, compare it to what it's like in the present, see if there's a difference and mm. if it's gone in the right direction. Now, not, not in everything, but in a vast majority of dimensions of human uh, well-being, uh, health, freedom, knowledge, access to culture, uh, I think we, we have made I mean, uh, more ov- progress. Obviously, this is the, the, the core of the book, um, but in a sense, your worldview as an atheist isn't that there is any overall meta narrative or dialectic or or grand purpose in the universe and yet when i hear the word progress i always think well there's some objective standard to which you are progressing that suggests there is something external to us which we're measuring ourselves by so how do you square that circle Oh, the, the the fact that the uh, laws of the universe don't define any arc of progress doesn't mean that, that uh, human interests don't define an arc of progress. There are certain dimensions of um, human existence that we can say are inherently good. For one thing, they're prerequisites to us being here and having this conversation, like we're alive, mm-hmm. uh, like we're well-fed enough to, uh, to, 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 to be alive and to have the wherewithal to, to have this conversation, that we're literate and educated enough to be able to exchange these I- ideas, that we're not constantly looking over our shoulder uh, if someone is going to uh, blow us up or, or machine gun us, uh, that we aren't living in an authoritarian regime that'll throw us in jail if it doesn't like one of the opinions expressed. So all of the, just the, even the prerequisites to rational discussion uh, identify certain values as inherently worthy, like life and health and freedom uh, and, and so on. Once those are defined as, as uh, uh, goods, they give us a, a uh, morality that is uh, universal. It, it just comes with mm. being alive and with, and with not uh, enshrining oneself as the only entity in the universe. As long, if I value something for myself, then there's no basis for me to deny it to, to you and to everyone else. And then that gives us a metric as to whether progress has taken and place. And this for you would be how what humanism would essentially be contained within. It's, it's, that, that would it's be, this, yes, this that would be my characterization. Of, of having that, that sense of, of progress defined by the characteristics of what make for human flourishing. And so that's right. that, that sets the, the, the benchmarks for what progress would be. And it's not logically necessary that progress takes place. And of course, in many parts of the world, in many times of history, there has been uh, regression. There's been a mm. uh, uh, move backward. So, But that, that allows us to pose the question uh, intelligently and then to use the, the facts to, to answer it. Now, Nick, you co-wrote a book rather cheekily titled uh, The Case for Christian Humanism, Why Christians Should Believe in Humanism and Humanists in Christianity. So you actually believe that humanism at some level is also rather like the Enlightenment, dependent on a Judeo-Christian worldview. Well, um, humanism is a slippery term, of course. um, And I think, as Stephen would agree, it's it's not owned by atheists. It's not owned by any particular ideology, religious or otherwise. It is a commitment to the human. And then you can unpack what what that means. Um, I would absolutely count myself as a Christian humanist. And I I encourage when I go talking about this to audiences for them to to do so, because um, the values resonant in humanism, and it's a little unclear how you define those exactly, resonate with a great deal of Christian um, thought and, and reflection. I would argue, and I know this is obviously where Stephen and I would, would, would part company, that there is a secure basis for uh, humanism within Christian thought than there is within atheist thought. So, for example, I would, I would, I would say that a commitment of humanism is um, ineradicable human dignity and fundamental human equality. Mm. Now, you can understand that, and you can trace, you can historically trace that through the through 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 European thought, certainly, and you can, as it were, justify it on on theological grounds if you if you, if you do that kind of thing. Um, I don't doubt that many, many of my atheist friends are committed to um, human dignity or human equality. I can't see, as it were, where the deep foundations for that are. I don't think reason in and of itself, let alone science, acts as a sufficiently robust foundation for that commitment. And, and I was struck that a couple of times in the book, Stephen, you, you refer to human life as being sacred. And it strikes me as a kind of a, an, an importing of a very kind of religious word to justify a non-religious worldview. 
So it's not that I want to say that humanists, atheist humanists, are not committed to human dignity mm. and equality at all. It's just that I don't think their foundations are quite stable enough. Well, I think they're they're stable enough to result, for example, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which has uh, not a shred of Christianity in it. Oh, no, let, in me the, push, let me push back on that. The, the Universal Declaration was drafted by Charles Malik, who was a Lebanese Christian, and it's very telling that the word person appears in the UN Declaration six times. That person is rooted in the personalism which was which was mainstreamed by Catholic social teaching in the 30s and 40s. So the UNHCR are absolutely right, as Maritain said, and as you rightly quote, it deliberately doesn't draw on any um, metaphysical foundations because we want people to agree. But you can see the fingerprints of personalism in the drafting. Again, you know, hi- historically you can see fingerprints of, of many things, and Maritain uh, convened a council of uh, multi-confessional intellectuals and moralists, Hindus and uh, Confucians and, and the Muslims, uh, and, and indeed was pleasantly surprised that there was so much agreement. Uh, it, uh, you know, I, I think there's a perfectly robust justification for humanism. Not, you see, atheism is not uh, uh, itself a belief system. It's, it's the absence of one particular belief, namely in supernatural entities. But aside from that, there isn't any such belief as atheism. Uh, but humanism is uh, grounded in our universal humanity, the fact we're made of the same stuff. We're the same species. We all are sentient. We all have the capacity to uh, experience pleasure and pain. We all have the capacity to to, uh, reason. And that is a pretty rock-solid foundation for universal human rights and universal human dignity, whereas parochial beliefs um, such as that only by accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior can we we be saved, uh, that does open up uh, a, a space for the persecution of people who don't accept Jesus because they're a, they're a public health menace. They're going to prevent. They're going to cause people to go to hell. Uh, and in fact, that's a, a, a counter to universalism if the path to salvation is accepting this particular parochial Messiah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, in one sense, and I've, I've already said, and I entirely agree that there are perils within the particularism of Christianity, and you know, we have plenty of examples of history to, to to show that. So, I certainly wouldn't argue against that. I would push back on the idea that simply being rational or being made of the same stuff is enough to justify our, our, our humanism. It, I mean, you know, really, um, Darwinian evolution is a, a pretty solid foundation. You and I would be, I'm sure, absolutely fully paid up Darwinians. I don't buy into the idea that Darwinism is entirely about competition, but there is nothing in it that dictates that I have any moral responsibility to those other than my kin or from whom I might get some reciprocal good. Yes, no, it's the wrong place to look for, for uh, as a grounding for morality. And it's not, I don't think it's, it's has- coincidental that so many kind of very, very public atheists today are also public Darwinians who then try to distance themselves from the alleged ethical implications of Darwinism. Well, they're, they're, the, uh, Darwinism is the wrong place to look for a, 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 ground, for a uh, grounding of morality. It comes from the interchangeability of uh, perspectives and the universality of, of interests. Uh, Darwinism provides some of the, uh, the, the facts that we have to acknowledge, facts about human nature, facts about the origin of life. But no, it's not a, that's not what it's a theory of. But, it, but um, it's pretty hard to, to, to sweep away you know, 300 million years of evolution. I guess that, 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 that's the point. It might, might not be the place to look, but from an atheist materialist point of view, it's certainly the place we start. Well, it's, it's the, the place that we start in uh, asking the question of how we came to be, why why we have brains, why we have bodies, why what life consists of, but uh, it, it it is not and doesn't claim to be a uh, uh, a justification for for morality. Well, it doesn't so now. A, I think again that's, that's important to emphasize in 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 the latter half of the nineteenth century and into the twentieth century, there were those who did explicitly try and ground morality and indeed polity on an evolution and it's only through the disaster of social darwinism and the disaster of eugenics that we have pushed beyond that to realize or some of us at least evolution absolutely right as a factual explanation for our material origins if you like but we've seen what happens when we try and turn it into ethics and politics and it's a catastrophe yes yeah, so and of course social darwinism had very little to do with darwin it originated with herbert spencer 10 years before the origin of species was even published so it was kind of it was 
retroactively uh, named social Darwinism. And uh, it, it must also be said that the disaster that you spoke of, it's actually uh, historically not accurate to, to say that, that, uh, that Nazism, for example, was influenced by Darwin. Uh, Robert Richards has just published a book, Was Hitler a Darwinian?, where he combed through Hitler's intellectual influences and found that actually Hitler despised Darwin uh, for well, a number of reasons. Uh, again, uh, I don't want to get into yeah. Nazism, but it's the reductio <laughs> right Hitler, <laughs> yes, as they say. Or I think Godwin's we law. just need to p- pull apart <laughs> yeah. um, Hitler, who I think uh, whose intellectual influences were pretty poor and his, his, his own thinking processes were pretty thin, with Nazism, which, disgusting as it was, had influences, one of which, only one of which, I think, was Darwinian. There was nationalism, there was paganism, and there was complicity by I German mean, the, Christians. The overall but one of which was I'm, Darwinism. I'm getting here, though, is, is that for you, Nick, um, scientific progress it, it also needs to be married with some kind of an ethical view of how we use that science. We can't simply say great, we've got science. Oh, absolutely. Stephen, and, and and Stephen would, would agree oh, with absolutely. that. Absolutely. I mean, these uh, are just different, so, different categories. Yeah. But, but the, the moral progress is not in any sense inevitable, I think Nick is saying, that we've gone oh, off no. the rails in the 20th century in a big way. Um, why would we assume that it's it's necessarily going to continue in, in that fashion. We don't. <laughs> the, the, the claim that there has been progress is not the claim that progress is inevitable. In fact, the, the point of enlightenment now is that progress is a gift of enlightenment ideals. Uh, to the extent that they're implemented, progress can happen. To the extent that counter-enlightenment ideals push back, they won't. And, and, and I, I'm going to, as in putting a shout mm. out, as my yeah. 13-year-old daughter would say for Stephen on this, I and mean, he's very, very clear right from the beginning that this book shouldn't be read as an excuse for moral laziness or mm. we're, we've, 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 we've achieved so much we can rest yeah. back on our laurels. It's actually a clarion call, and correct me if I've you know, read yeah. it wrong, it's a clarion call to, to, to pursue moral progress on the basis that we've done very well as opposed to pursue moral progress on the basis we're facing a crisis. Mm. And I think that's a very helpful corrective. Why don't we go to a specific? So one of the um, graphs in your book is about slavery and essentially emancipation and the way in which s- slavery today, uh, you know, if you went back a few hundred years, um, is almost non-existent in, in the way that it was legally sanctioned in previous centuries. Um, for you, obviously, that is a marker of moral progress. I think everyone around this table <laughs> agrees with that. We might have different opinions, though, as to whether science, humanism and reason are responsible or whether there has been some kind of a, a religious imp- uh, impulse as well in, in seeing that, that progress happen. I mean, for you, what, in what sense is, is the science, the reason and the humanism the responsible factor for the a- abolition of slavery? Well, c- certainly uh, humanism is. Uh, science helped in um, m- much later in establishing that all humans are uh, members of a single species, cl- uh, closely related, uh, with, uh, trivial differences among them. And so uh, ancient beliefs that uh, the races were separate creations or that Africans were inherently fit for servitude were shown to be scientifically uh, com- completely indefensible. Uh, but it was, ma- it was mainly uh, humanistic arguments that that uh, began the abolition mo- movement. Um, but the were these, was this the, a secular humanism? Um, because as, as um, Nick has said, humanism has had many flavors over. Uh, it has. Years. I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert in the history of the abolitionist movement. My understanding is that the first uh, fully articulate um, uh, uh, argument against slavery came from Jean Baudin in the uh, 17th century, and it was on secular grounds. Uh, then uh, Locke and uh, Montesquieu both made arguments uh, that were, again, primarily secular, although both of them, uh, like everyone at the time, had, had religious influences. Mm-hmm. There were particular religious denominations that uh, carried the movement forward, Quakers being the, the most prominent, but also American uh, Methodists. But on the other hand, uh, Christianity and Judaism coexisted with slavery perfectly well for millennia. The Bible has no problem with slavery. It says you can't beat your slave to death. But you can you can beat your slave, and you're allowed to have a slave. Um, Christianity for all of those centuries didn't seem to have any problem with it, and of course the slaveholders themselves were uh, mostly devout Christians. So in crediting uh, the Quakers for um, the abolition movement, and they absolutely deserve credit, mm-hmm. we can't call that religion because it was one particular denomination uh, in a sea of religious denominations that were all over and, the map. And as far as you're concerned, whatever they did do was more in concert with the humanism rather than the religious tenets necessarily of, of their faith. Yes, and it's, I mean, it's, it's really not a, a, a terribly uh, abstruse argument. Uh, Africans are human beings. They can suffer. They've, the institution of slavery uh, 
causes tremendous suffering, violates any set of principles that we ourselves would be willing to submit to, uh, such as that one person can o- own another. There, it, it, it isn't hard to come up with arguments against slavery that don't involve invoking a, a deity or a messiah. What, what, what's your response on this? Because I, I, frequently the slavery issue is raised as well. Mm. You know, Christian, the mm. Bible doesn't seem to speak out against it throughout mm. scripture and, and so on. Yet at the same time, there were, of course, abolitionists, strong abolitionists in the Christian movement mm. and so on. Nick, wh- wh- where do you come down on this? As is always the case, history's messy. So um, the abolitionist movement, um, particularly in its excess, was staffed by evangelicals who argued from scripture. Um, they, however, were almost certainly turned towards the abolitionist cause from the more humanitarian culture in which they live in the back half of the 18th century. The Quakers, as Stephen rightly says, deserve um, the, the greatest respect for this because they are articulating arguments against slavery from the early 1700s. You have the 18th century being the period of enlightenment and being the century where the number of slaves transported vastly exceeded any other century. There's a paradox there. Going back to the, the, the very good point about slavery in early Christianity, yes, on the one hand, you certainly get a willingness to countenance the institution of slavery in the early church, so second, third, fourth century. On the other hand, you have concerted manumission campaigns you have a very careful um, um, uh, sort of arguments against slavery, although not on the grounds that we understand them, that have been unpacked by Carl Harper recently to do with sex. Mm-hmm. And then you have someone like a uh, church father like Gregory of Nyssa in at the end of the fourth century who stands up and effectively says slavery is not permittable. And that's a quite extraordinary thing to do that early. And it's not accidental that slavery is unwound in the so-called dark ages in the following 500 years or so. It's a very slow process. And in retrospect, you can say as Christians, we should have been much more attentive to it. But it was nonetheless the fact that before the slave trade began, actually before Europeans encountered other races, there was no slavery as the ancient world had known it in Christendom. What do you say to that, Stephen? Because at one level, I think your your view is, well, if science can show us that we're all essentially biologically the same, that should inform the way we treat each other. Um, I get from Nick saying, actually, we kind of have to change the way we see each other at some kind of spiritual level almost or, or social cultural level before we necessarily say, well, well yes, we're, we should treat each other the same in that way. Well, I, I'm not so sure about what the spiritual level is, but in terms of, but certainly we have to go beyond the scientific demonstration that we all belong to a single species and, and add that part of belonging to a single species is being sentient, is uh, we, we have brains that allow us to suffer and to flourish. Uh, all of us have those brains, uh, and that is the the right that we are respecting when we uh, when we enshrine universal human rights. So, I mean, I think that's that's an important point. But I wanted to pull apart that idea of the scientific demonstration of all belonging to the same species or all having the same origin. Now, I don't disagree with that, of course. But famously, Darwin wrestled with it because when he published in 1859, he didn't know that was the case. He was determined that it would be Darwin vilified, loathed slavery and and came from a quasi-abolitionist stock, but his science then didn't dictate one way or the other. It was his moral framework that... And that that was, as far as you're concerned, more more influenced by by a Christian well, worldview I mean, than... This, so this, this, is a, this is a classic w- w- with Darwin. He did lose his faith. Um, he lost it somewhere between returning from the Beagle and, and Annie's death in 1851. But there's correspondence between himself and Emma, who was very upset that he loses his faith, in which he basically says, I still hold to a Christian worldview. I just don't right. hold the tenets. The, the, the He's a complicated so. man. And, and Darwin is also influenced. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't think this was in 1859, but certainly um, when he wrote the expression of the emotions in animals and man, he uh, gathered data on what we would now call human universals from travelers, missionaries, explorers, traders of uh, facial expressions and customs in uh, people all over the world and uh, uh, and wrote that since we have the same um, 
uh, emotional reactions to uh, life's events. We show them on, on the face the same way, whether we are Africans or Indians or Australians. That was a kind of empirical underpinning mm. to the conviction that he probably had beforehand that we all belong to and a I single species. I think that's the critical thing. You see, the conviction, the, the, the moral or the spiritual conviction came, co- often comes first, and it certainly came first with Darwin. And according to that, the... Uh, the evidence gathering and the theorizing leads him to confirm or deny certain things, but it's not so much empirically led as empirically informed. We're going to finish with one final question, which I'll ask to both of you in turn. Um, we, we've really been asking today, has need for God essentially been eliminated by science, reason and humanism? So your final answer to that, Stephen. Uh, I, I, I would say yes, both logically, that there are not compelling reasons to, to believe in God, uh, and empirically, that as societies become uh, wealthier and better educated, uh, belief, belief in God declines. Not entirely surprising, I'd say no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go ahead, um, Nick. And um, I like Augustine's quote, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And I, I think that's why irrespective of what happens to institutional religions around the world or in Western countries, there is this restless yearning for the transcendent deeply interwoven into the into Homo sapiens. Stephen and Nick, thank you so much for joining me on the programme today. Thank you.